And there's a couple of other standard components on a Formula One car that come from McLaren Applied, being the, the dash display and even yep. the uh, LED tail light. So you really yep. do provide a, almost everything for the F1 car? Yeah, anything that's, uh, anything that's uh, you know, lights up, we, we, we provide. Um, the, the dash, which is called the, uh, the PCU, um, that dash uh, is, is not just used in Formula One, actually, it's used MotoGP. Uh, by, by a number of teams. But um, yep, the dash, uh, it's, uh, it's gone through a few revisions now, but it's, it's very, it's very um, well established within Formula One. The rain light, of course, the rain light is a, is a, is a standard ECU part. Um, uh, all of that is, is available from our catalogue, not just for Formula One, it's available for other people to buy. So don't be put off by the prices from the initial Formula One costs. Um, all of these components are available to purchase um, from any, for any formula. And, and can be easily adapted to most ECUs out there on the market. And again, the, the breadth of ECUs that you provide means that you supply not just Formula One, but probably more, more, more categories than people would expect. Yeah, yeah, they do. They, they cover a lot of categories. We talked earlier about MotoGP. Um, we talked about, uh, the, well, there's, there's, there's IndyCar. Uh, there's a lot of work we're doing there. Um, there's, there's the new uh, LMH, uh, Le Mans hybrid uh, mm -hmm. vehicles, um, companies like Toyota. Uh, do invest heavily within within MA and require a certain level of support. Uh, yeah, it covers it covers a myriad of, of, of motorsport categories. Uh, we were talking about the dash uh, briefly, um, kind of looking at future technology. Um, we've seen from the helmet display that the you know, the dash is spinning around on the steering wheel, except for the Williams, which has it static. Um, is there already lo looking towards um, heads up displays or alternative ways of giving driver data during the race? So I believe in the late 2000s that Williams actually did try that with, mm. with the BMW. Um, it's, it, it's all about driver comfort. Um, heads up displays can be seen as being a distraction. The, the driver uh, would like to look at the display when he wants to, uh, as opposed to it being right, right in his vision already. It, it, it depends. It, it, you know, we'd have to get a, a, a discussion around whether or not it's actually necessary. And we've got to remember now we're in a, a cost cap environment. Yeah, so, it, so it's all about uh, you know, performance versus cost, whereas before it was all about performance. Now, done this, does this bring performance for the, for the value or the, the investment into it? We know it's out there. We know the technology's out there. Um, but it's whether or not it's relevant to, to, to racing. You know, do they have the time to have this uh, right in their vision? And uh, another area which um, became very complicated during the 80s and 90s was suspension and then active suspension. Yeah. And it was very hard to police. It was considered a driver aid. Yeah. Um, and suspension now on the mechanical side of these cars has become incredibly complicated. Yeah. With a standard ECU, is it not better perhaps to look for the future to go to some kind of standardised active suspension? Yeah, well, it's been, it's been uh, talked about. It was actually talked about uh, as part of the new regulations, in fact. Um, it's, not a, it's not a difficult thing to achieve now. It's actually a very simple uh, system to achieve um, with the technology we have and with the ECU power that we do have, um, which goes to show how well advanced it was uh, back in the 90s um, to, to, be, to be almost uh, considered now, um, you know, some, some 30 years on, is, is quite a testament to those technologies back in, in the 90s. But it wouldn't be a difficult thing to achieve but whether or not that takes some um, onus away from the driver um, as, as much as you know, driverless cars, you know, where, where, where are we going with this and what, what is the boundary? And you sort of touched on autonomy there in terms of cars and AI is an area that's being spoken about increasingly in technology. And when you've got so much data and we're talking about this, you know, the software packages that you mentioned earlier, is there use of AI and machine learning to help the engineers work through you know, all of those reams of data? Yeah, that's an in interesting question. Um, it, it, covers, it covers a number of areas. It could cover the engineers or it could cover the sporting side. Uh, and when I say the sporting side, even, even cricket now are getting into, into AI to, to help predict um, or to help uh, people who may be within the, the betting industry predict uh, you know, how they're going to um, you know, win. So um, yeah, ultimately uh, AI is uh, a, a force of nature. It's not going, going to go away. It could be something we could consider um, for, for the cars. At the moment it is being used for, for driverless vehicles for, for uh, monitoring uh, obstructions 
And um, however, you know, could it be used in an F1 car? Um, yeah, there's no reason why it couldn't be used in an F1 car at all. It could be used in a simulation environment, so it would be an interesting, interesting thing to, to look at for Formula One. Again, it comes down to cost, you know. Um, McLaren applied, I mean, we've spoken very much about your kind of your catalogue of products, the stuff that you can buy off the shelf, but almost as important in that to the, the business is the services side, where you're taking on projects for customers, not just in motorsport. Tell us a little bit about the, the other range of things that, that McLaren Applied have been involved with. So McLaren Applied have been involved in, in lots of things, uh, from personal transport right the way through to trains you know, to, to, to multi, multi, multi people transport. So um, they cover a lot of, uh, a lot of technologies um, that, uh, that from, from motor racing are adaptable to, to the outside world, as it were. There, were. there were some applications within the medical industry, whether or not it be, you know, uh, trains or, or personal transport. So there is a wide uh, range of applications that our catalogue can see, as well as automotive too. Uh, one of those kind of key projects was in Formula E where you are currently the, the tender holder for the, the battery and electrification is in probably an increasingly big part of McLaren Applied and the crossover technology from motorsport into, into other areas. That's right, yeah. We currently provide a, a 350 uh, kilowatt uh, battery system to, to the, the Formula E cars. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's an increasing uh, area of business for us. Um, uh, and in parallel, the automotive sector as well. You know, there's a lot can be learned from a, from a racing battery that we could add into to an automotive battery. Our, um, our, our resident um, engineer, Steve Lambert, is, is uh, one of those guys that can, that can sort of marry the two together. What are the kind of the key areas that motorsport really brings to, in terms of transferable technology with electrification? I think um, in materials is, is one is one thing. Because obviously, once you uh, once you you have a, 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 a battery powered vehicle, ultimately you want the vehicle to be as light as possible, so the vehicle is, is as efficient as it possibly can be. And one area that uh, that Formula One can can assist is uh, is certainly in materials. And when we're talking about electrification, we're talking about so the materials used to to, to build a motor, the what you, how you encase a battery. Um, the, the fluid that you use to cool the system and um, yeah so there are lots of transferable skills and, and I would say the majority of which are, are material based. And away from materials I think again we go back to that software thing and I think that McLaren Applied have been involved with some, some hospital software again uh, an area where you wouldn't think there would be a natural crossover. Yeah medical, medical systems uh, has been in the remit of, of McLaren Applied um, with, with, with you know the main concentration being motorsport but medical electronics and medical um, systems have been uh, been involved um, with with sort of you know seeing the synergies between the two. Certainly, data analysis uh, and and uh, instrumentation, uh, something that McLaren Applied are you know are masters of, and something McLaren Applied stepped up to. Um, uh, sadly, just a year and a half ago was uh, to do with the pandemic and uh, all of the uh, the breathing apparatus. That's right. Uh, as did a number of teams. Mm. You know, um, it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't go unnoticed that a number of teams uh, all got together and uh, and created uh, anything from ventilators to to CPAPs, as you know, with with Mercedes HPP and uh, and and, and uh, McLaren Applied were, were were part of that team. So, you know, we're we're all we're all in it together. Uh, when something like that happens, the motorsport village, um, uh, as as we'd like to be known, um, do do come together. Uh, in the village hall and, and make things happen. Looking forwards now to the future for McLaren Applied, um, you know, what, what sort of projects, what sort of areas does, does the future hold for you? So uh, for us, future uh, is, is, is things like silicon carbide uh, inverters. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that can be brought into, uh, into, into Formula One. You know, we've had cars for a very long time. We've had some sort of, you know, electrification on a, on a Formula One car you know, longer than most road cars industry, yep. most road car com uh, uh, companies. But, you know, there are battery technologies out there, inverter technologies out there that can be applied to, uh, to Formula One and to most motor racing that are being developed right now by, by MA.